Well, good morning and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I want to welcome you to uh, another chapter of the Longevity Project and the Stanford Center on Longevity's uh, Longevity Book Club. And uh, a couple of housekeeping items. Um, you notice my my colleague in arm, arms, Ken Stern, is not on this session. Ken is actually out uh, traveling around the world researching his own book. So, But he will join us for the next one. And somewhere within the next year or so, we will be interviewing Ken about his book. Uh, but we have producer Kate on camera today. You have seen Kate in previous sessions, but she's always behind the scenes mon monitoring uh, the online chat and making sure we get all the questions answered. Uh, but I asked her to be on camera today and uh, sort of actively help manage the conversation with those of you online. Um, and I also have to apologize. I have a very croaky voice today. I think I'll be fine, but if you see me guzzling my water, um, it's, it's to take care of the croaky voice. So we are really privileged uh, today to have Caroline Paul join us. Um, Caroline is a, a, an acclaimed author who has written a number of books, including uh, the be New York best-selling book, The Gutsy Girl. And as we were prepping, I was telling Caroline that uh, I'm working out of my home office today and Gutsy Girl is in our, our bookshelves somewhere in, um, in the house. And I would encourage you, if you have a, a favorite preteen girl in your life, Go look up Gutsy Girl and get it for them. It's a great book. But anyhow, um, we're talking today about her new book, which is Tough Broad. Um, but a quick introduction of, about Caroline that I find kind of interesting. Uh, she claims that she was once fearful, but even as a little kid, it seemed like she was pretty adventurous. I read that when she was 13, she uh, attempted to break world record in crawling, which was 12.5 miles. Now, when I was 13, I was not thinking about breaking a world record in crawling. Uh, as she almost made it, but was thwarted at uh, 8.5 miles by skin knees and hypothermia. Um, so Caroline was an undergraduate here at Stanford, so virtually welcoming you back to the farm. Uh, and after she graduated, uh, I read that she promised herself a life of confidence and excitement and self-reliance. And it was clearly a promise that she has fulfilled because she has flown planes and jumped out of them, rafted huge rivers, mountain biked at 15,000 feet in the Bolivian Andes before there were mountain bikes, and then spent 14 years uh, fighting fires as one of the first women firefighters in San Francisco. There is so much to unpack here. So um, let's get going. Um, Caroline, thank you for joining us. Oh, I'm excited to be back, back, in, back at the farm. Near the farm, I, I, you know, I, I was going to put up my, you know, Stanford backdrop, but I forgot. <laughs> so, um, so Gutsy Girls and now Tough Broad, uh, can you talk to us a little bit about how you got into this subject and your own relationship with adventure? Well, I actually started thinking about writing Tough Broad when I was 55. I was surfing uh, out here in the cold winter surf. And I saw a lot of men my age, but I didn't see any women. I saw a lot of men older than me too. And I'm actually not a good surfer. I'm a really good paddler. So I knew there were women who could be out there, but they just weren't. And the same thing was when I when I was on my electric skateboard or uh, flying my experimental planes, I saw very few women, if any, but really tons of men my age and older. And I began to just wonder like what what should what is my fulfilling aging going to look like? So this book is kind of a quest. It's mm -hmm. different from Gutsy Girl. Um, Gutsy Girl was really about. I was interested in the messaging that we give girls about as we raise them about being afraid instead of being brave. And I thought it was really important that we teach girls to be brave because I felt like it was safer for them to be brave than afraid in their life. Mm -hmm. uh, you know. But we, we, I think we did that. I mean, we teach them to be afraid because we think it's going to protect them. Um, so Gutsy Girl was a response to that. And it hit a nerve with a lot of parents, uh, for sure. And But I didn't want to write Gutsy Girl for adults. I didn't feel like I had anything particularly to say to my peers, because I have a particularly, you know, narrow upbringing. I'm, I'm, or, or adulthood, let's say, I'm white, I'm privileged, I don't have kids, I'm queer, I, um, 
you know, I, in a lot of ways, my experience was very narrow. So tough broad is actually a quest. I ask other people about their lives instead of trying to tell people mm -hmm. about mine. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I'm curious about, was there something in your upbringing, uh, were your parents adventurous or, you know, what, what caused you to sort of embrace this, uh, you know, sense of adventure in your life? You know, I had like a feral childhood, like most of us did it when we were born in 1963. We were sort of told to get on our bikes and come back at dark. And uh, so that was adventurous in itself. But my my parents were not outdoorsy at all. They introduced my twin sister and my younger brother to things like skating and sledding and swimming because they wanted us to be well-rounded. Mm -hmm. And also I think they wanted us out of the house. <laughs> but, it, but there was no sense of like, let's make them resilient. Let's teach them risk assessment. I mean, those were words that I don't think were part of the parenting vocabulary back then. <laughs> they just simply... Um, wanted us to be happy social kids. And so I had a, and we lived in the country. So I had a, I had a good foothold in being outside and uh, I realized how much I loved it. Uh, you know, I, I'm one of six um, and I'm, I was born in 1959. So I totally understand that, that makeup. My mother kicked us out of the house just because she wanted to have a cup of coffee in the quiet. So, <laughs> so a little different than I think today. Um, I, you know, so what, what, what's your favorite adventure from childhood? Um, you know, honestly, we used to get on our bikes and just go. And uh, we would go to the corner store where it was five cents for an ice cream cone and we'd read <laughs> comic books all day. And then we'd bike back and it was uh, four miles each way, which was for us pretty huge. Mm -hmm. Just being uh, on our own was an adventure. We would skateboard to school. We were terrible skateboarders. I think we walked most of the way, but still it felt like an adventure. We were with our friends. We didn't know what would happen. Yeah, yeah. we never do it either. Um, so I wanna spend a little bit of time. So I don't consider myself adventurous. And I read the book kind of going, oh, oh, could I do that? Could I do that? So can you, can you talk a little bit about the threshold between adventure and danger? Um, well, <laughs> Danger is everywhere for one, but I mean, I think as any adventurer would tell you that most of the time we don't go out there to almost kill ourselves. I, I have to say that when I was young, I wasn't very smart. And I, I think I did conflate adventure with sort of near death experiences, but mo most of the smartest and most um, colorful adventurers really understand risk assessment. So they match their skill with what they're doing and they factor in the uncertainty and it's kind of like life. So people always go immediately to the danger part, but I, you know, I've known people get in, obviously as a firefighter, I saw many car accidents. I saw many people just stepping off the curb of a street and mm -hmm. getting hit by a car. So danger is a tough word to sort of, you know, pin down. You know, now that you mentioned your firefighting experience, I, I'm really curious to understand your thought process from being a communications major at Stanford to becoming a San Francisco firefighter. What what was in that? Well, I, I wanted to be a journalist. Um, so I studied communications or actually I specifically was thinking I would be a, a documentary filmmaker mm. because I thought it would give me a life of adventure and pay me. And <laughs> I actually was working at KPFA here in Berkeley mm -hmm. when the fire department opened up its uh, testing to women. And there were lots of accusations about sexism and racism at the fire, San Francisco Fire Department at the time. So as a reporter at KPFA, I just thought I would do an undercover story. And so I actually went through the testing process in 1987, I think it was, uh, for the, um, the newest recruits. And I ended up passing every milestone. And, you know, racism and sexism, you can't just like see it in an hour or two yeah. hours. I was... Yeah. I was uh, naive that way. Yeah. Uh, it's it's way more insidious and and deeply embedded in institutions. By the time I was done with the testing, first of all, I got in, which surprised me, and secondly, I realized that um, you know it's full of brave people doing their best, um, and the work was adventurous and it was going to pay me. So I took the job. <laughs> Any regrets? No. Oh my God. I became such a better person being a firefighter. You know, you see people at the most intimate time in their lives. It's a tragedy 
almost always. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And there's, there's really, that's really an honor in a lot of ways. And I, I really grew up as a firefighter. I was, uh, I worked on the rescue squad, which meant yeah, yeah. we're responsible for a lot of the most technical and dangerous rescues like, um, well, first of all, we, did, we were responsible for rescues and fires, but we also did all the hazardous material rescues. We did oh. surf rescues, surf rescues, uh, cliff rescues. So we were sort of the Batman of the fire department. And uh, I really did get my fill of adventure. <laughs> um Let's let's talk a little bit about the book. Uh, you have some wonderful profiles of different women in the book. Uh, when you started researching in the, the book, how did you how did you find these women? Were they are there out, out there? Many of them. Well, first of all, the, it's not a book of profiles, and I was really clear that I didn't want it to be that way. It's really my own quest to find fulfilling aging and how the outdoors would fit into that because I didn't want to let go of the outdoors, but I was going to, if in fact, someone had a secret that was telling me, yeah, you shouldn't be out here either because nobody else is. Mm -hmm. um, so, but what happened was, so my plan was kind of to huck myself into the research uh, phase by just interviewing people who were outside and older than me. Um, like any, the paraglider that I was, I was basically just going to step off the cliff and be like, okay, talk to me and we'll see what happens. But the pandemic hit. And what happened was I couldn't interview people. I had to sit down and do research. So what I did is a lot of research on what fulfilling aging was. So by the time the, um, the really the, the dense part of the lockdown lifted, I was pretty ready to see uh, how, what outdoor adventure matched with a fulfilling aging journey. So you you talk about these pillar, fulfilling uh, uh, pillars of uh, for fulfilling aging. What are they? What did well, you find? Some of them are pretty obvious. Uh, there was uh, five. The first four are community, novelty, purpose, and health. And those those I found most people agree on. But what I was really also interested in was our mindset. Because what was becoming clear to me is that the reason women weren't out there on the waves with me or on an electric skateboard was, had something to do with the toxic messaging that we're getting as we age, which is basically mm -hmm. that, you know, our aging journey is going to be, as women, is going to be full of, you know, declining cognitive health, certainly frail bones, uh, we're culturally irrelevant, uh, we're boring. And you, at women will tell you this, that they feel invisible after a certain mm -hmm. age. My friends were very disheartened about their aging journey. And there was, the, and then I stumbled upon research that said, the way we look at our aging predicts how well we age. Mm -hmm. This was eye-opening to me. I mean, the science says that if you have a negative view of your own aging, if you think your aging is going to be a time of illness and decline, you have a much better chance of cardiac arrest earlier, cognitive decline earlier. And the opposite is true. If you have a really um, vital sense of your own future, if you mm -hmm. think it's going to be full of exhilaration and uh, exploration, you are going to be happier, healthier, and live seven years longer. And this that's pretty big. I mean, you probably know this research, but for me, it was new. And but what I realized was, okay, thank you for, for telling me that, but how do I get that? How do I get that positive mindset in the face of such toxic messaging, such subliminal messaging about my aging journey? And I had the, a feeling that it would lie in outdoor adventure. And mm -hmm. I was right. Yeah, there's, uh, there, there's, there's a funny um, cyclicality to it. I mean, there really is truth and fake it till you make it um that you know all of those things you said are true but even when you're not feeling all that vital if you go do something that takes you in that direction so uh you know i can imagine that first step into doing something outdoors taking an adventure even if you're not feeling all that adventurous sort of begins that circle of um regenerative health behaviors well, that and it actually, I mean, you are vital if you step outside and you're feeling the sun or a little wind or it starts to rain. I mean, there is a vitality that actually happens. And this is the magic of uh, getting outside is that 
every single outdoor adventure that you will take is a direct rebuke to all the messaging that you are hearing about your future aging. And that's mm-hmm. the beauty of it is like you, when you step outside, you are, you do have an exploratory mindset. You, so for instance, I visited these boogie boarders in uh, San Diego and they call themselves the wave chasers. And they're made up of 60, 70 and 80 year olds. And even there's a woman who's 97. And I spoke to one of them and, you know, I'm a surfer. So boogie boarding, it's kind of a simple activity. I kind of look down on it. I got to say, uh, you know, it's a, for those of you who don't know, you just grab a flotation device. Maybe you have fins, you wait out, you catch a wave, or in this case, you catch the white water. You don't even catch a wave. But I spoke to Lorraine Voigt, who was 62 at the time, and she had joined just two years before. She said to me, Caroline, and it still gives me chills, boogie boarding changed my life. And I thought, how did such a simple activity change your life? And basically what she told me was, here she was, 62, and here's the big Pacific Ocean. It's cold. It's vast. Here is this, she's getting tumbled by the waves. Here are people that are looking to her to have fun with. You know, she's coming three times a week. Like she's not frail. She's not on a cognitive decline. And she's, none of them thought they were boring. Just stepping into the water upended her own expectations of herself. And that was what was powerful. Yeah, there's, there, there is a fair bit in the uh, of research showing that, um, new experience of all of all kinds um help us as we age um so taking on you know learning a new language uh taking on a new sport uh just stepping out of your comfort zone is um really helpful in you know keeping keeping the neurons firing appropriately so well, yeah uh, and i looked into that cuz novelty is one of those pillars i was talking mm-hmm. about the thing about our, and I think it's great, learn a language, join a book club, like here, you know, <laughs> do something new. I'd ask my friends, when was the last time you did something new? Yeah. Everybody was like, well, we learned to stand six feet away from people a couple of years ago, but that was pretty much it. We don't learn something new as we get older because sometimes for good reasons, we we know what we like, but really it's a little bit also because we're on autopilot. So novelty is really important for the brain neurologically. And I'd love mm-hmm. to get into that. But on a bigger level, when you step outside to experience novelty, you're also getting all the other pillars. So when you learn a language, you're not getting your um, your health. You could be getting community. I don't know. Um, and you're definitely getting purpose. But you know, in terms of hitting all the, and upending your own expectations of yourself, I think getting outside, for, especially for women, is what does mm-hmm. it. Yeah. You know. So going back to the boogie boarding um, uh, example. Uh, you said as a surfer, you were like, hmm. Um, so how do how do you define adventure? Uh, you know, not everybody is going to jump out of planes and uh, wing walk. I know, Martha, thank you for telling me. Yes. <laughs> and I got schooled a lot in this book because I did kind of swagger in like, I got I know what adventure is. I've been a lifelong adventurer, you know, but I had by then done all this research on how medicinal it was to actually just be outside, you know, that it's just the health effects of being in nature are tremendous, incredible. So I wanted people to get outside. So I have a chapter on those health effects, but but I wanted people just to get outside. So I was like, you know, I'm going to I'm going to go bird watching, for instance. I went bird watching. And again, I went in like really an adventure, but really important way for people who maybe have some physical limitations or financial limitations to get outside with to, and do something. And I interviewed Virginia Rose, who is in a wheelchair, and she's been in a wheelchair since she was 14. And she started this nonprofit called Birdability. And Birdability brings people with disabilities of all kinds outside. So this chapter was going to be about adapting. Like, oh, you know, as uh, Virginia told me, we're all temporarily able-bodied. So That's great even if you're in on, you know, on your physical, your physical decline is coming or, or, or earlier than you'd hoped, yeah. you can still bird watch because look at Virginia Rose. Yeah. But was it an adventure? So I was going to write this chapter all about at adaptation and it's called adapt, but it was really about my all, also my own <laughs> emotional adaptation because I realized that 
bird watching was an adventure. We were on a quest. Uh, we were anticipating, well, what was that bird that we were hearing? <laughs> and the exhilaration when you actually saw the bird. There were long stretches of boredom, for sure, like adventures have. We were outside. We actually, and we were being very physically vital because not only were we outside, but we actually ended up, I walked, she wheeled, uh, six miles. We were on yeah. a bird of song. So what <laughs> I realized is, adventure is in the eye of the beholder. It's how you're feeling when you're doing it. It's not the actual thing you're doing. So you don't need to base jump. I did go talk to a base jumper. Um, you can bird watch. I, I read that chapter and I was laughing to myself because um, during COVID, uh, I actually, so I live on the peninsula, um, south of San Francisco, and there were a number of meetups, bird watching meetups, and so I'm like, oh, I can do that. That sounds fun and great. And I don't know anything about birds and I can stay socially distanced and I'm outside. We walked 10 miles up in the up in the hills and I'm going, oh, forget the bird. <laughs> it was one of the most exhausting afternoons I'd, or mornings I spent. So I'm going, that was not just a passive, let's take our little list of birds and our you know <laughs> binoculars. <laughs> so, um, I discovered that bird watching can be very physical, very physical, but a lot of fun too. So yes, but you don't also have to walk up, you know, the dish to bird watch. You can. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> yeah, I I probably should have done a little bit of investigating on this meet meetup group because sort of deep in the paragraph they were actually saying, you know, we're in the hills, we're off trail. We're like, oh, okay. So, um, so th the. I hate, to, I kind of hate to ask this because this is counter to what we're all talking about, but um, what safety concerns, are there safety concerns about adventuring as you get older? I mean, there's safety concerns about going outside and driving a car. There's always going to be safety concerns. I think people overweight that. I just think, yes, it's just one of the factors because the great things you get out of going outside far outweigh the risks. And what are the risks? I mean, this time you're going outside to take a walk in a park instead of going outside to walk in Safeway. I mean, I would say that it's <laughs> something that we're thinking of all the time. It's not mm -hmm. that it's not a factor. Just people ask me a lot about things like fear and safety. Yeah. I give them a lot. I, those are important aspects. But here's what I, I the way I think of it. Getting outside and embracing activity and adventure. Um, and again, adventure in that it's exhilarating, you're exploring, it's there's some novelty, some physical vitality. Um, that is so good for you on so many levels. And we take pharmaceuticals every day because we're told that it's gonna make us feel better. And there's a load of side effects for those stuff pharmaceuticals. And mm -hmm. often they're like, not very pleasant, diarrhea, <laughs> vomiting, don't drive that big vehicle. And I, I want people to think of safety and fear as a side effect. Like it's something you got to manage, you got to think about, but please don't let it stop you. You know, risk assessment is actually really good for the brain, like thinking about how you're going to react in certain situations. And I think we really undervalue ourselves. And again, like when you get outside and upending your own expectation of yourself, and it might be in the fear yeah. that you're pushing your fear or your safety just a little bit, just leads to these tremendous benefits. So, um, how do we, how do we shift our mindset about that? Well, this is the nice thing. You don't really have to be like now. I have to, uh, you know, tackle <laughs> all the negative messaging that I'm getting. No, that's. <laughs> Uh, you know, this is going to become much more seamlessly because it's an outdoor activity and outdoor activities in themselves are, are, I think they offer so much, frankly, fun, like play, I think is something that we underestimate. Maybe you've done studies on this because I know that it's well studied now, but it, we underestimate that as adults. We actually think it's, it's frivolous, but you know, we've seen that play is really, really good for us. And it's really fun. I mean, it's inherently fun. So a lot of this is medicine that we're taking that's 
on an emotional and a physical level, but it you don't notice it as medicine because you're outdoors and doing something often with friends. Yeah. You know, um, the importance of being outdoors has been studied uh, among kids, extensively studied uh, among kids. And, you know, so much so that they're, they're, there's a movement of what to actually change what early childhood education looks like and have it much more focused on outdoors adventure as opposed to forcing kids to sit at desks and, um, you know, learn the alphabet. But I don't think there has been much done on the benefits for older adults. But I will have to I will have to take a closer look. No, um, I well, could you and get back to me? Because yeah, I can't yeah. find it. What I basically did was cobble together a lot of these ideas. So yes, exercise is really important. And if you go to the gym for your exercise, that's fantastic. But just going outside, I mean, they have done so many studies on nature as medicine. So things like the tree chemicals that this is not just you know, West Coast woo-woo about negative ions and the, the, the tree chemicals actually lower your, uh, or uh, they bolster your immune system. Birdsong calms your brain, uh, mm -hmm. lowers your, your, your blood pressure. The, this one was crazy. I want to get a little more, I want someone who really understands the eye to tell me a little more, but allegedly, or what I've read is that the, the softer lines of nature and the fractal aspect of nature is it fits well with the way our retina is built, which means that there's a lot more ease in processing what we're seeing. So there's not so much crazy filtering going on. So the brain doesn't work, have to work so hard, yeah. busy work, noise, like we do in an urban environment with the hard lines and the loud noise. So that means that when people take a walk outside and then they're tested afterwards, they test way better on cognitive and memory tests, which says um, a lot about how good it is for our, you know, they, some of the things we worry about, like our memory yeah. as we age. Um, I'll have to go talk to, I, I, we work with a number of climate scientists who are actually looking at the impact of the absence of green space, the absence of, you know, the, the inherent problems of lots of concrete. So we, I know of studies that have studied the, um, the negative effects, uh, but uh, a couple of people in the chat are mentioning things that you might know something about. I don't. Tree bathing and forest bathing? Yes. There's other countries. <laughs> I talk a little bit about this in the book. Thank you for that. Um, they call it uh, forest bathing, maybe tree bathing. Uh, there's also, it's basically in, it was started in Japan where they realized their citizens were really stressed. So they, they started this, um, uh, the, the, the government actually funds sort of green space where you put your phone away and you're just supposed to walk with all your senses open to the trees. Mm. And it has measurable effects on people's stress and mental health, measurable. And in Finland, they have something called the power trail where they've, uh, they've put green space aside and then they've put signs at various places because I guess as humans, we need signs now to like look at this beautiful view or take five breaths and think, you know, deeply or stretch um, because they realize how good it is, how vital it is for us as a, as a community. Yeah. It's almost like uh, outdoor meditation, walking well, meditation. It is. Yeah. it is outdoor meditation. Yeah. Yeah. And let me, yeah. let me add to that actually is that, um, so bird watching, for example, really puts you in the moment in, in, in a way that meditation does yeah. as does, well, I'd love to touch if we can on the experience of awe, because oh. awe is something that has been studied recently. That's A-W-E, awestruck, awe, 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 awed, <laughs> awesome. Um, and I was un, I did not under, didn't know anything about this concept. It's really a concept that we've uh, sort of restricted to religious uh, nomenclature and people who are religious are used to this word and understand it. It basically means um, the, a feeling of sort of fear and wonder and a little dread in the, in the presence of something bigger than you, something mysterious. And so nature is actually uh, an, an awe trigger because when you look at the sky, the big sky or the Grand Canyon or a towering yeah, redwood, yeah. that yeah. actually triggers awe. And I was unclear on this concept and had spent many years going outside thinking I was chasing adrenaline, but mm -hmm. 
But as I got older, I realized mm, I'm kind of psyched about when I fly hitting like rough air. It didn't actually do the same thing. <laughs> didn't thrill me like when I was younger. And I started to think, am I getting boring or is this the pandemic? Yeah. <laughs> and then I went wing walking. So I went wing walking, which is the ridiculous idea of getting out of a perfectly good cockpit at 3000 feet in the air and climbing onto the wing of a plane and then strapping yourself to the middle. And I did this because someone sent me a video of Cynthia Hicks. She's 71 and she, I saw her do this. And I thought I have to talk to this woman because I was very interested in what a one-time adventure might do for us on a neural level. Like what is it? It's kind of like novelty, like jumping out of a plane kind of thing just once. Yes. So I went wing walking and I was reluctant because I am a pilot. I didn't want to get out of a perfectly good cockpit, but <laughs> book. And I was pretty surly all the way to the King Post as I, it's not walking by the way, as I write in the book, it's, it's like wing slithering, wing <laughs> crawling, like, you know, you're at 3000 feet. And then I, I tied myself to, into the King Post in the center on the top of the wing. And then the pilot does barrel rolls, loops, and hammerheads. And I went from being surly <laughs> to being ecstatic. And I did oh. not know what had happened to me. I honestly did not know. So when I got on the ground, I started to do research and I realized what had happened is that I had experienced awe, which is basically when your neural system can't process what's going on. And the scientists call it a reset button for the brain because it does make us more open and more creative. And again, I think it's a neural thing. Our brain works on patterns and suddenly there's a pattern that we can't quite grasp. And so that leaves a lot of open space. Yeah. And yeah. it turns out we live in a world of anti-awe devices, which is basically our phone and our computer. Yeah. Those are the opposite of awe that it like teaches us to focus narrowly and it gives us the illusion of power and control. So here's the good news. So awe, it turns out, is really good for us. It lowers our inflammation markers. It makes us feel more gratitude and more compassion. Uh, it reduces anxiety and depression. And when I saw this, I was like, oh, wow, I guess I have to get everybody to go wing walking. <laughs> but it turns out you don't need to wing walk. Yeah. Because they did a, a study here uh, in San Francisco at UCSF at the Memory and Aging Institute. I'm sorry if I got that name wrong. But um, where they asked volunteers between the ages of 60 and 80 to go on what they called awe walks. And what that was is they just asked them to go on a 15 minute walk and to look at everything with fresh childlike eyes. They were basically cultivating awe. And then they had the control group that just walked for 15 minutes doing what we always do, which is worry and look at our phones. And they followed them over eight weeks. And, oh, and then as an, almost as an aside, they said, could you, by the way, take a selfie each walk? So after eight weeks and they did all the measurements, these, the all walkers reported much less, significantly less anxiety and depression. Their, mar their infl inflammation markers were way less and they also spoke about feeling more compassion and gratitude. And that is because when you feel awe, you feel more interconnected because awe makes you kind of smaller, but you see your place with everything else. Um, and so here's the cool thing about those selfies. <laughs> in the beginning, those selfies, they just showed the face in the middle, like we take selfies. But as the walks continued, the face of the awe walker receded and the background got bigger. It was like a metaphor for awe. Like they started being more interested in the bigger picture. And so that's, what, I mean, again, like awe, it's really good for us. And you don't have to wing walk. <laughs> Thank goodness. Okay. Yeah, I'm kind of curious about this this relationship to awe and both the fact that adventure is in the eye of the beholder, but also kind of its relationship to green space in general. Um, just knowing that, you know, I myself live in a pretty urban area. I work throughout the week. Um, so kind of are you still in, in kind of your research and experience, are you still able to achieve that same kind of awe from going outdoors if it's kind of 
in more of an urban environment or not so much in a green space yep. or really these benefits coming through the most when you're properly outdoors in the trees, et cetera? Well, it's the most when you're outdoors in the trees and they've shown that like the, the greener the space, the more well-being overall you get. Mm -hmm. uh, this was uh, awe aside, but certainly you can cultivate awe just by looking at the one tree that may be in your neighborhood. I mean, again, it's accessing that wonder and that amazement. And I think as an older person, I'm way more able to access that. That is underestimated, I think. When I was young, I was, there was a lot of murky, like self-doubt and insecurity that was mucking up a lot of my day-to-day -day life as I walk through it. And now, to be honest, I've shed most of that. And I think a lot of us have. And so accessing awe is so much easier. So yes, you can do it by just seeing that one bird that, and again, you know, I, I spoke to one of uh, the bird watchers and he had had, he was a lot younger and he had had MS since he was very young. And he just stayed inside all the time until he started realizing that he loved birds. And he started from his kitchen, looking out the window and gradually step-by-step step, birds drew him outside. He put a feeder out, then he was on his porch and then he was on that six mile walk with me because again, it was a step-by-step -step thing. And suddenly he was, you know, more, it was a bigger outdoor activity, but it didn't start that way. Right. But in terms of acts, so this one thing I really, I feel very, very strongly about is that the outdoors is for everybody. And I realize that sometimes there are not green spaces accessible to people. Maybe they don't live in a safe neighborhood that they mm -hmm. can't get outside. I agree. And I, all I can say is there is nature there. It might be tiny and, but try to find it. And have you found this is kind of a follow-up slightly related? Have you found that these different kinds of adventure in different environments, do they provide different benefits on, on kind of a health level or is it you know, you're able to access this all, get outside, get active, and the benefits follow no matter what you're doing. I, honestly, like I'm an evangelist. The benefits follow no matter what you're doing. I mean, I'm somebody who gets out on, you know, again, on my paddleboard in the bay, but you don't have to do that. I feel like I feel exhilaration and exploration and physical vitality in my way, but there's uh, there's so many other ways to do it in tiny ways that that fit who you are, your financial background, your physical situation, um, what color you are. I mean, the outdoors has been very, very unwelcome to people mm -hmm. of color for a long time. And that hopefully is changing. And I really am clear in this book that, um, and I talk to people of color who have found their way outside and thank goodness for that, because we have been egregiously, that has been an uh, egregious situation for a long time, you know, from the sundown towns that didn't allow parents of my generation. So I was born in 63. Some national parks weren't desegregated or weren't even desegregated until 64, which means <laughs> that my peers had parents who were like, you better not go outside because it's dangerous. Sundown towns where you couldn't be caught in those towns if you were not white after dark. I mean, that has a impact on you know the kids whose parents had to experience that. So hopefully this is changing. I see a lot of outdoor groups that are for people of color and they they're plentiful and they can be found. It's not true that people of color don't want to be outside or are not outside. Um so that leads me to ask a question about you know you and I are of a generation where you know we saw a lot of women firsts um, the fact that you were one of the first female firefighters in San Francisco is kind of, it would be mind boggling to my kid that, you know, that was just that recent. So do you, do you find over time um, more models that we can look at? So we're not so, we, we, we can point to people and say, who look like us um, of our age group. Uh, do you think our daughters are going to be as reluctant to do some of these things as as we are? I do think that the mindset aspect, so the messaging that we're getting about our aging is the, I thought that was the most powerful reason that women were not outside. 
Uh, and of course they are outside. I found them and they kept telling me we want adventure. We are adventurous and we are here, but they are much harder to find. And I feel like unless <laughs> the messaging about our aging changes that as women, we, um, you know, because a lot of the cultural currency that we rely on is changing. So our looks are changing, our mm -hmm. reproductive value has changed, um, our caregiving has changed now that our kids are out of the house or maybe we're divorced or we lost our partner. I mean, so we hit 60 and we have kind of a new identity. And so I'm, so it's up to us, I think now to impart on, our, on the younger generation, just how cool it is to be this age. And by the way, <laughs> this was awesome. Of the women I spoke to and the women who were older than me, they all said the 60s was their favorite decade. So I was approaching 60. I'm 60 right now. So I'm like psyched. And that was eye-opening because the messages say, oh no, the 20s are the best. Well, I don't want to be 20. Are you in your out of your mind? Or 30s or 40s? Like I feel like I've really come into my own. I think a lot of my peers feel the same way. Uh, we're in the early stages of doing some research on... Um, uh, how physical appearance influences uh, healthy behaviors, um, you know, and uh, and this in sort of pilot data, we actually found that um, women, as they get older, they don't want to look like they did in their twenties. What they want to look, they want to look healthy, and it's less about the wrinkles and more about the glow. And there is sort of growing evidence that how you um, think about yourself physically is what influence, and I think we touched on this earlier, sort of may prompt you to take uh, better care of your health. And I so we're trying, to, we're trying to, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, and also the way, so when the way people respond, so for instance, my own mother was my best subliminal message, which I, of course, I didn't realize until I myself got older, because we do not, <laughs> as you might know, Martha, I don't know if you're your mom, but we don't appreciate our moms until too late, but my mom really blossomed after 40. She divorced my dad and uh, oh, my dad. A great story. Yeah. She just got happier. And then she just got kept getting happier. And at 60, actually she had just split with her, the love of her life. He, he, she had been with him for 20 years and they split and she was now 62 and in a new town and she was having a really hard time. And this was like an inflection point. I found that a lot of people picked up outdoor activities at a kind of a unstable moment in their lives. My mom had never been an outdoors person. She didn't view herself as outdoorsy. She definitely didn't think of herself as brave, but she thought here I am in a new town and I have a bike and there's a bike group and they're made up of 60, 70, 80 year olds. I can keep up with them. And so she joined and it was really supposed to be a distraction but it became a passion and I saw her blossom again in her 60s for the next 20 years. She bicycled and had her own community. She had, she became physically super fit. So she felt really good and she acted like she felt really good. And then people yeah. in turn are like, wow, you're a bicyclist. You just went on a big, you know, bike ride through blah, blah, blah. And they're impressed. And that cycle of, um, yeah, positive reinforcement is really empowering. Mm -hmm. I, I've been looking at the comment in the chat from um, John Stauman. He said, I'm 81 and I run trails, roads, and track five days a week. And I'm so excited to run my next half trail mar marathon later this, this month. Um, uh, living, oh, he, lives, he lives down in the peninsula. Uh, living in this community has resulted in a renaissance for his, my running attitude and happiness. Cold showers are fun too. And good for you, I hear. Yeah. And that's, <laughs> I just say the one thing about going outside as we're at, in, at later ages that a lot of the women, they didn't, they, we care so much less about what other people think or how good we are. None of these women were really good at it. Some of them were mm -hmm. actually kind of bad at it, <laughs> but it was the enjoyment and the, um, the awe, you know, and the amazement they felt when they were outside. That was amazing. So go John. There, there is, I actually went to a um, surf camp for older women and right. they kind of said like, if you've surfed before, please don't join this. Uh, because there was some- You'll ruin uh, it. <laughs> that's it. There was some comfort in us all, you know, failing at the beginning together. 
<laughs> and very little embarrassment at that point. So, um, uh, you know, I, there is there's safety in numbers when you're all not good. So, um, so I'm curious, like, what is your recommendation? How do people take the first step? I mean, you take the first step by just taking a step. Um, you know, I interviewed my base jumper, Sean Brokeman, who actually lives up here in Marin. She's also a personal trainer and she calls herself actually an adventure trainer because she realized that older women were coming to her saying they wanted to get fit. Um, but really what they wanted was adventure. Like that's a, a thing that they were missing from, you know, their lives. They were moms, they were, you know, working. It was just the same old, same old. So she would take them out on trails and find that they really blossomed, but they were resistant, a lot of them, and didn't think they could do whatever it is she was asking of them. And so she would say, well, what did you, what did you do as kids? And that would trigger like the mm. sense of what they might like to do now so that it would be just more seamless for them. So I tell people to do that and also to say yes to somebody who asked them to go outside and just do it in small, small steps. You know, it was crazy. A lot of these, the women I interviewed, they found their adventure by simply going on the internet. Cynthia Hicks, who was the wing walker, she'd actually had cancer in her 60s. So a lot of her outdoor activities had to fall away. She was, by the way, the most grateful person I'd ever met. She had so much gratitude for, she's like, I scuba dive for 30 years and now the chemo the chemo is pretty hard on me. So I'm just going to give it up. But you know what? I'm so lucky I had 30 years. So she mm. was adapting, adapting, adapting. And what she would do is just type in the into the search bar, something fun to do here. And she found <laughs> wing walking. So, um, and people did meetups. And it's kind of an exploratory mindset, which I think we really have in our 60s, 70s, 80s and beyond. Because as one of Oh, one woman I interviewed, I was interested in novelty. So she had learned to swim at a late age mm -hmm. at 68. And which is amazing because swimming triggers a lot of our deepest fears. And she said that, you know what, the reason it was easier age helped is because she realized there was no second chances that she was just, it wasn't like she could put it off and uh, wait another couple of years to learn to swim. So she was just going to try it now. So that mindset was really great. Mm -hmm. You know, there, there is, there is uh, work that says, you know, as people get older, um, they, they, be, they become more positive, I think, despite uh, uh, common sense, but also because they have this lifetime of experiences that allows them to sort of under manage the risk assessment. It's like, oh, I did, I survived that, I survived that. And I know other people who've done this. So um, things that might have been uh, feared when they were younger, it's like, no, 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 you know, I've survived worse or I know other people who have. So right. the odds are with me. I love that. Live statistically. <laughs> love that. Um, so there were so many sort of great stories in the book. Do you have a favorite? Is that like asking if you have a favorite pet or a favorite child? <laughs> I, I don't have a favorite. I had constant surprises. I will say that I went and um, learned how to BMX bike race from the oldest female BMX racer today. She's 74, Kitty Weston now, or Miss Kitty. And I went because I had a specific idea that competitive sports would be really important for our neural system because I knew they were good for kids growing up. There's a mm -hmm. lot of studies on that. So they must be good for us too. And I went like, and BMX bike racing is an individual sport. You get on your bike and you race around the track. And I thought that this would be um, perfect to write about. And instead, what I found was even though it was an individual sport, the real gifts of BMX bike racing, despite as well as the fact that it was very physically vital. And of course, neurally, you're always learning something new as Miss Kitty told me, but the community aspect was so important. No. And no. I was really take. I started to realize <laughs> that in every one of the situations that I saw that I, and when I interviewed women, community just kind of sprung up around them. And they had what's called a, not just touch points of human connection, but a deep sense of belonging because the outdoor activity gave them what is called by uh, scientists like you, a cultural apparatus mm. in order to sort of play out this belonging. Like they, they were important to the way these, this ran as Miss Kitty was. I mean, when I went around, she was famous. Everybody wanted to talk to Miss Kitty. Yeah. I'm looking, I'm just scanning through the chat. They're like, people are saying, 
some of my scuba diving experiences created awe after the fear. Snowshoeing is safe for me. Uh, biking has been mentioned um, a couple of times. Uh, uh, Sheila just posted, when I get on my bike, I feel 12 years old again, although I'm 85. I love that. Yes. And you can have a uh, tricycle if you can't, if you're losing your balance, there's lots of ways to adapt. Just walking is eye-opening and awe-inspiring. Um, so is there anything you won't do, you won't try? I mean, honestly, I did not go base jumping. So <laughs> Sean tried to uh, convince me because I am a paraglider. So I'm I know about um, paragliding is when you sort of like hang gliding, but you use a soft bed sheet basically. But <laughs> um, but I thought, you know, I think I'm not going to base jump. So I guess that's my limit. But um, so that that, that was a, that was a great little part of the story. Can you just sort of expand that whole chapter of your experience, sort of rescuing the base jumpers? <laughs> Well, the base jumper, uh, Sean, I was interested in, she was 52 because I, I didn't think anybody would really, I wasn't trying to encourage people to base jump. It's considered one of the most dangerous sports in the world. But what I realized is we definitely need inspiration. And Sean was the most unlikely of base jumpers. She's a kindergarten teacher. She's a grandmother. She's African-American. I mean, none of that fits what we think is a, is a base jumper. She's 52 years old. And... Uh, so I wanted to write about her because we need those templates. You don't, don't base jump, find your own base jumping, mm -hmm. you know, metaphor and do that. Did she ever get her equipment back? Oh yeah. She was arrested, <laughs> sadly. I mean, good for the book, bad for her. She yeah. was arrested and caught, um, but she has not gotten her equipment back, sadly. It's been uh, three years and oh. she's a very, she, I mean, she's the most careful person you'll ever see. So it's a little sad that they, they, they caught her. Base jumping is basically, is illegal. Uh, almost, there's only one place in the United States where you can do it. And she was, a, she was uh, El Capitan, right? She was at Yosemite, yes, where yeah. you cannot do it. Yes. No, well. You can, you can climb, you can um, high, slack, high line. Uh, you can do a lot of other very dangerous things where rescues are super dangerous, whereas a base jumper rescue is not really gonna be that dangerous, frankly, because it's just gonna be, I mean, picking up a body on the ground to be very, very blunt. So it doesn't actually make sense, but hey, I'm not here to, to. Um, I was just here to write about just the amazing inspiration that Sean is, just yeah. being herself. Um, Yeah, I read that part and th that was at the very beginning of the book and I'm going, okay, is it gonna be a suit? That was one where I'm going, <laughs> I don't want people to be put off by that. So <laughs> I bird watch, I boogie board, I go walk. <laughs> um, so one one last question. Um, what's what's your next adventure? I'm actually, uh, I will be, I learned to fly a gyrocopter in the book. Uh, because you do have a fascination with things with wings. <laughs> yeah, I do. I love flying. Um, a gyrocopter is very different from the other things I flew. So it was a test of my own sort of brain plasticity. And I wrote about that and I'm going to be flying my, and it's a, it's a tiny little experimental open cockpit that looks like a little bug. It, it has a rotor. It looks like a tiny helicopter, but it's open cockpit. And, uh, it, um, I'm going to be flying that from Sedona, Arizona, back to my hangar in Petaluma. Oh my gosh. May. Yes. It'll take, you know, four days or something. Flying over. Say, how how yeah, far do you go? At, how I'll fast does it go? I'll probably stop at like 20 airports on the way to, to fuel and kick the dirt and talk oh to goodness. pilots oh about goodness. how rough it is up there. <laughs> well, I can't wait to uh, see what you write about that. So, um, Caroline, this was great. Thank you so much. And I think you've inspired me to do something. Um, oh, yeah. I don't know what it is yet. Uh, I'm not going to hike Kilimanjaro, as Barbara Wiss just posted, but maybe. <laughs> Why not? Um, yes. Uh, so, Kate, do you want to? Um, yes. Can I just thank you both for your work. Uh, I mean, this is so important. And thank you for having, because I think our ideas definitely intersect. So. Uh -huh. Oh, selfishly, this is a great opportunity for us to learn about uh, so many things that are happening outside of, you know, academia. And, and this is great. Thank you. I really feel like I want to just close my laptop and run outside and just you know, <laughs> the mountains. Um, yeah, thank you so much. This has been such a pleasure. And thank you, everyone, for joining us.
Um, I'm happy to share. We have a couple other book club events coming your way in the near future. Um, I'll be dropping the links to those in the chat momentarily. Um, the first one up will be a conversation with Andrew Scott. That'll be on May 1st at 3 p.m. Um, and he'll come to discuss his recent release, The Longevity Imperative, how to build a healthier and more productive society to support our longer lives. Then in June, we'll welcome Maddie Dykewald to the book club. Um, that'll be on June 6th at 2 p.m. ET. And she will come on to discuss her upcoming release, Ageless Aging, A Woman's Guide to Increasing Health Span, Brain Span, and Lifespan. Both of those links are now in the chat. Um, thank you all so much for joining us today, and we hope you see you next time. Thank you all. Bye. Thanks, Carolyn. Thank you.